Everyone look at. Hello everyone, um, give me one second to get my notes in order and then we'll say a prayer and we'll get into it. All right. Great, I'm just going to bow my head. Hey Lord, um, yeah, thank you for your Sabbath, thank you for everyone that's made the effort to come here today, thank you for the visitors and um, for the regular attendees, Lord I just pray that as we we go through your word, um, that it can be clear as day. I pray that I can hide behind you and that your words will come out of my mouth and that I can just be a mouthpiece for the message that I believe that you want to share with everyone here today. Um, yeah, Lord, I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Cool. Thank you all for having me here today. Um, I've hope, I hope you've all had a good start to your year as well as your Sabbath. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, my name's Lockie or Lachlan Harrington and um, yeah, if you've been coming to this church regularly over the last year, you might have seen me. I worked here as a community chaplain last year. But today I got the, the call up from Houston Ford. Um, he invited me to come and speak and so Tara and I, uh, my wife, still a bit crazy to say, I got married a couple of months ago. We've been living in Maruya for the last couple of months since then. Um, we've driven up here this morning at about nine o'clock and we're here today. So um, yeah, fun fact, this Sabbath about a year ago, actually this Sabbath exactly a year ago, I was baptized. I made the public decision to follow Jesus and I was baptized in this very church right next to me. So it's a pretty cool fact, but considering that it's been a bit of a full circle, it's been 12 months since that happened and it's also the beginning of the year, I've spent some time pondering the last 12 months as or in preparation for my sermon or my message today. And I've come to a bit of a conclusion as to what one of, one of the main takeaways of my last year was. Um, and that's what I'll be sharing today. So I'll be speaking about something that everyone, want, everyone wants to know, but not everyone finds. And uh, it doesn't matter how poor or rich you are, as Faustina just talked about, everyone's searching for it, but not many people find it. And that is the key to happiness. So by the end of my message today, I hope that there's no confusion um, and that all the ads on TV that sell happiness can go out of business. And I'm going to try and do my best, even though it is Sabbath, to try and sell you the idea that this is the true key to happiness. So I'll do my best salesman technique and I'll um, hopefully hook you in. But give me one second and we'll get straight into it. So before I get there, I hope that everyone is on the same page. So I want everyone to be completely sold. So I'm going to really push my point a lot. And you might get sick of hearing me repeat it or something like that, but I want everyone to be sold that this is so undeniably true and that God, which is where the key to happiness comes from, that's not the key to happiness. Well, it is indirectly, but there's more to my sermon than just God is the key to happiness. I want you to all be sold that what he is saying and what I'm sharing today is truly the key to happiness. So as I was saying, I got baptized here about a year ago, and when I, when I spoke about, um, I shared a testimony, which is basically a story of how I'd gotten to that stage and why I'd made the decision that I had. And in that testimony, I said that I'd gone searching for happiness and purpose in a few different things, like my friends' approval, uh, parties, all those sorts of things, and, and trying to be a professional footballer. But it wasn't until I discovered this awesome principle and started implementing it into my life that I realized or experienced rather true happiness. Um, but before I tell you though, because it'd be too quick and you guys will probably just shut off for the rest of the thing, I need to set some context so that I really get you when I finally reveal it. So give me one couple of minutes before we get there. Um, so where it comes from, I think there's We're not going anywhere yet. Um, <clears throat> the key that we are looking for comes from the Bible, which a lot of us know. It's a collection of stories um, written by messengers or prophets under divine influence of God. And these stories actually reveal a lot about God because they're written by prophets as, they, as it was spoken to them. So it it's pretty much goes through what God is speaking about and, and what, pardon me, what God says reveals a lot about his character. 
in the Bible, there's a specific people group called the Israelites, who God uses as a means to bring about the birth of his son, Jesus, um, who was uniquely separate and yet the same as him. And Jesus was born to be a substitutionary and literal sacrifice for all people on earth to close the distance that sin had created, which was a problem that everything was facing, um, to close the distance between God and them and ensure that they could spend eternal life with God. And so there's a lot more detail that could be added to sort of further understand the gra gravity of this situation, but a lot of this might be repetitive for all of you and I don't want to bore you too much. So thankfully the Bible sums itself up pretty well in John 3, 16, 17. And you might have got a bit of an insight before when I had a bit of a mishap, but John 3, 16, 17 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And we all, hopefully we all know that. I feel like I always say that I know that and then I blunder around it and sort of just end it before and let someone else finish the, the verse for me. But it is a very important verse because it does sum up the Bible very well. Basically, it's saying that God loved and um, something that he always has and always will do and that he is a God of love and the object of his love is the world. And so he sent his son to save us from that, that problem of sin. Um, fortunately, that includes all of you here today. So I'm including you in my sales pitch now. This is definitely directed at you and it, his love includes you. He also loves us regardless of whether we love him. Um, yeah, it says in 1 John 4.19, we love because he first loved us. So regardless of your relationship with God or your lack of relationship with God, he will always love you. And this is confirmed all throughout the Bible. There's so many different stories of it where God loves us regardless of our, our posture towards him. Um, and he respects that posture, but he still loves us. The best one of that, though, is illustrated in the prodigal son. This is all Bible 101. A lot of you guys might know this stuff, but um, I believe it's uh, the best story of what God's love is, regardless of our posture towards him. I'll offer a brief summary, because rather than turn there. Um, so basically, in this story, the son, there's a son, a Jewish son, and he basically wants his dad to be dead so that he can take his inheritance. But his father gives his inheritance anyway, and then this son goes off and starts partying it all away and gambling it and all those sorts of things, and eventually runs out of money. Um, he has nothing left, and so he has to work in a pig pen, which for a Jewish man back then would have been inconceivably low. Like it's, I don't know, it's like, I'm not going to make an analogy just in case there's someone that works there. <laughs> but... He has nothing left, and he gets sick of this, as you could imagine, so he goes back to his dad with his cap in his hand, obviously feeling a bit of shame, and to his surprise, and everyone else's surprise, including his brother, his dad welcomes him back and throws a big party. It's a pretty common story, but Jesus uses this story as an analogy for us, and I think it clearly illustrates that God being the father and us being the son, we can run away, we can reject him, we can even want him dead, but God will still love us and continue to do so. So it's already revealing a lot about God's character. And yeah, I, not only does God love us enough to sacrifice his son, but he also loves us regardless of whether we're reciprocating that love, which I just think is amazing. Now I've laid all this context because I'm trying to gain your trust. I'm trying to gain your trust before I truly sell you the key to happiness. And before you know it, I really, actually, before you know it, you'll be salivating. I didn't want to go there, but I will. You'll be so keen to hear the key to happiness, or I'll have just gone for way too long, and I said I'm, I'm doing a sermon, and it says I'm down for a sermonette, but I'll get you out before one o'clock, I promise. <laughs> a few more things, and I'll tell you. You might be concerned that God and his love is not the same as it was thousands of years ago. But in Malachi 3 verse 6, and I'll turn there because we all should get our Bibles moving, if you can join me in doing so. Malachi 3 verse 6. It's just before the, the New Testament. Malachi 3 verse 6. I'll let everyone catch up. It's a bit tricky. 
It's literally the, the first book before the New Testament, or the last book, rather. Cool. Malachi 3, verse 6 says, For I am the Lord, I do not change. Therefore you are not consumed, O sons of Jacob. So I'm just, basically, I'm, I'm going through some points out of the Bible just to confirm that God's character is a noble character and that he truly loves us. And this is just pointing towards the fact that that love that he expresses in the Bible is no different to what it is today. And he says that himself. I've got a bit of a funny story to stress the point, and I'll, I'll try and get to the... Um, it's a little bit further, I'll have to go back. But this, you may or may not recognise it. When I was younger, I've always played soccer, or football as I try and call it in Australia, but it don't succeed very well. And since when I was young, I, I first started playing because I was motivated strictly by lollies and food, and so the whole idea of me playing would be to try and win some sort of lolly at the end of it. Then they brought out this awesome thing. This is a voucher, so if you got man of the match, um, which is basically the best player of the day, you would receive a voucher to go to McDonald's right there, and that was something that my family never let me have. So all of a sudden, all my focus went into trying to win man of the match. And I got a few, but it stopped after a while, and just as I started to get good, I, I, I wanted, I, they stopped it and they discontinued it. Anyway, I fast forward a few years, I was cleaning through my stuff, still playing soccer, pretty much for food and lollies, and I found this voucher in my room, just hidden somewhere, I had, I'd never used it, and I was so happy, and I, re I remember running out to my mum, I think she was in her bedroom or something like that, and I, I said, um, Mum, look what I found, like, I'm so happy, let's go to McDonald's right now, drop whatever you're doing, we're going to McDonald's right now. And I would have been 10 or 11, so my comprehension skills weren't quite there. And she just straight away looked at it and pointed to the expiry date on the, on the voucher. Pretty much crushed my reality, and as you can tell, I was gutted. I'm saying this because I'm trying to make a point that God is not like this. God does not expire like my man of the match voucher. As he said in Malachi 3 verse 6, God and his love are not like a McDonald's Happy Meal voucher, and they do not have an expiry date. So next point, as I said, I'm just trying to get us to the point where we can fully believe and fully trust that God has our best interests at heart. Um, so three final things, and I'll go back quickly. Not only does God love us, which I think I've established pretty well, he also has our best interests at heart. And this is really important you guys subscribe to what I'm saying, because if you don't, then you won't trust that it's the true key to happiness. But I think I'm offering some pretty solid evidence. In case you're not convinced, there's also three more things that he wants for us, and I'm just going to proof text here and look at some quotes from the Bible. The first one being John 15, 11. And it says here, These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. So Jesus is, this is Jesus' words, and he's saying that he wants his joy to be in us or, or in all of you here. And I took away from this that God wants us to be happy, and I think that's pretty clear in itself. The next thing is in John 10, verse 10. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I interpret that, and I think it's pretty clear as well that God wants us to be successful. He doesn't want us to have a life of mediocrity. He wants us to have a life and live it to the full. He wants us to be successful. And finally, this is a personal favorite of mine. Mark 4, 39, it speaks about how the disciples are in the sea, there's a huge storm coming through, and um, Jesus is asleep, all the disciples are freaking out because they think they're about to die, and then they go and wake Jesus up, and Jesus stands up and rebukes the sea and the wind, and says, peace be still. And it's awesome, I mean, it's a, an amazing miracle that he could literally control the wind and the sea, but I like to take this as sort of a words of comfort. And um, particularly in stages where I've been in struggles or, or been, you know, in, in poor mental health, those sorts of things, I've relied on this verse to get me through because Jesus is saying, peace be still. Throughout all your troubles, peace be still. And I believe that's the third thing that God wants, us, God wants for us as well, peace in our troubles. And he offers some words of comfort when we are going through those sorts of things. All right, so we are finally there. 
I'm going to hope, but I know I'm pretty confident. I'm very confident, actually. I'll use very strong adjectives so that I can sound even more convincing. But I know that I have convinced you all that God is a good guy. If he, I mean, not a good guy, a great God. And he has your best interests at heart. He loves you. And thus, because of that, we can trust that he will have the key to happiness. Or we can trust that his key to happiness is in your best interest. Key to, in, key to happiness is found in the book of Proverbs. So this is what I really want you to subscribe to. It's in Proverbs 3, verse 5 and 6. It's not a happy meal. This is in the English Standard Version. And it says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all ways, acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. So God, who wants the absolute best for you and has enough power to do anything I mean, he created the world literally in six days, which is pretty awesome. He's saying here that if we let him, I guess, have his will in our lives, if we acknowledge that he, um, yeah, if we acknowledge that how powerful he is and, and let him have his will in our lives, then he will make our, our lives straight. He will straighten our paths and straighten meaning smooth or successful. And, and most importantly, which is what I've been trying to say the whole time, the key to happiness, he will make happy our paths. I believe that um, straight means happiness as well. So the key to happiness is letting God have his will in our lives. Um, it's a pretty straightforward point. Proverbs illustrates it really well. But I guess when I found this verse and, and sort of was going through preparing for this sermon, I thought, oh, that's all well and good. That's a pretty digestible message. But how do we actually know when we are having God's will in our lives? How can we check ourselves so that we know, oh, okay, this is God's will for my life? Um, unfortunately for most of us, God doesn't give us a phone call and let us know exactly what he wants us to do or exactly who he wants us to, to be with or, or to live with or all, all those sorts of things. He does sometimes, but not very often. So to make sure you guys not only have the key to happiness, I also want to go a step further and hope that you'll subscribe to what I'm saying and really want to buy what I'm selling. I'm going to give you five tips to make sure that you can continue to be happy and that you, continue to, that you can know what God's will for your life is and how to check that as well. So number one is making sure you have the right approach to... Um, this is a foundational point. So making sure you have the right approach to having God's will in your life in the first place. Part of our, um, our calling as Christians is to, yeah, I guess, make sure that we're not trying to glorify ourselves, but rather to glorify God. And there's a bit of a, a thing here. You can, the best way to, to, be, to be in touch with God and have the right mentality towards success and having God's will in your life is to actually consult Him and um, spend time with Him in prayer, I believe. And there's a bit of a quote here, some of you might, may have heard of it, but it says, prayer is surrender, surrender to the will of God and cooperation with that will. If I throw out a boat hook from the boat and catch hold of the shore and pull, do I pull the shore to me or do I pull myself to, sh to the shore? Prayer is not pulling God to my will, but the aligning of my will to the will of God. So I'm going to make a point on prayer in a second, but this is basically putting us the most important step, I believe, is making sure that we're right with God and that we're in line with what he would want for our lives as well. And the best way to do that is to spend time with him. But yeah, as I said, prayer is a great thing as well. And that's actually my second point. The second way to know that um, what God's will for your life is, is to literally just ask him. Um, I mean, for example... When we were down the coast recently, we were, everyone was asking us, what are you doing for Christmas? And it was pretty straightforward to, to respond with our answer. It was, it was as simple as that. And the best way to ask God what exactly you should do with your life and what his will for your life is, is to pray and ask him, Lord, what do you want me to do? And he'll often reveal it in, in lots of different ways, which we'll continue to look for in a minute. Step two was pray. Step three was check what the Bible says. So, I don't know, if you're ever considering, oh, is it God's will for my life to steal or to kill someone or all those sorts of things, it's pretty clear in the Bible that you shouldn't do those things. And that's what I want to encourage you to do. If you're not sure what to do, there's plenty of examples within the Bible and you can just literally 
go through the Bible and, and find something that addresses the problem that you're wondering about and it will answer you. That's step three. Step four is consulting others and, and um, consulting others for their biblical perspective. It's very important that we speak to other people around us about what, I guess, their advice is to what we should be doing, uh, particularly if that you can tell that they're spiritual sort of people. Um, I'm going to turn to Proverbs 11, verse 14. So if you can all join me there as well. This will just further illustrate the point. Proverbs 11, verse 14. Cool. Proverbs 11 verse 14 says, where, then, where there is no counsel, the people fall, but in the multitude of counselors there is safety. As I'm saying, I'm just giving you some quick fire steps so that, to make sure that you're in the, the right spot. And the, Sometimes the best way to know what God's will for your life is to, is to literally speak to someone around you that you know to be biblically grounded and see what they say. Um, fifth step, I'm moving pretty fast, is looking for providence surrounding the decisions that you're making or the path that you're looking to take. Um, and when I say providence, I mean things that are just too good to be true, things that add up, that are just, you can't explain, like, I'll give you an example. When Tara and I were here last year, um, we were trying to decide what we should do. Um, pardon, before we came here last year, we were trying to decide what we should do. And it was really hard for us because we had so many good options, but we didn't know what, we should, what path we should take. Um, so we wrote some things down. We wanted to be able to set up ourselves so that we could get married um, and we wanted to be able to work and we wanted to be able to save some money with that as well. And so we, would, we wrote them all down and we're just like, okay, God, I did all these other steps. We've, we've prayed, we've consulted others. And then all of a sudden, all these things started to open up. I started to get phone calls from Houston saying, oh, I just thought I'd mention to you that, oh, there's some way you can live now, things like that. And Phil would say, oh, by the way, we've, we've changed this, the structure of the Bible workers thing, so you guys will be able to be helped out financially. Um, so it was, it was all just way too good to be true, and it led us towards going to Canberra, which is somewhere that we originally didn't think we would come back to because we'd been here for so long. We're very thankful that we did, but I can tell you that it wasn't a preference thing to come back, and so it was, it was not because it's disliked, and I, I want to be careful because I am in Canberra right now and you guys are all looking very menacing from up here. Um, but it was something we wanted a new challenge and then we got some perspective and all these things started to line up and it was perfect for us to come back to Canberra. So that's the fifth step. I'll give a quick recap and then we'll wrap it up. God loves us all the time and we spoke about how his character is that he loves us regardless of our posture towards him. And he loves us, he's loved us since the beginning of time because he exists outside of times and he will continue to do so. As Malachi 3 verse 6 has said, he's not like a man of the match McDonald's voucher. And I gave you the key to happiness. Oh, sorry, I also spoke about some things as to what he wants for us. And I tried to set some groundwork for the fact that he's a very trustworthy guy and he wants the best for you. And then finally, like after I'd revealed that, um, as you all know, I gave you the key to happiness coming from someone who loves you the most. And I think that for all of us here, it would be easy for us to, um, yeah, I believe it's easy for us to accept that that is the key to happiness because God's giving it to us out of love, not out of trying to benefit from it. It's not a transactional key to happiness. Yeah, and then um, I gave you some tips just because I'm the best salesman ever. But to wrap up, Maybe there's some, um, some of you guys here that are, um, yeah, are searching for happiness in different things. Like, like I said before, for me it was, was trying to be a professional footballer and I'd be happy for a couple of goals that I scored and then all of a sudden I'd be unhappy again. Or I'd be trying to get my approval from my mates and then all of a sudden they'd say that my joke wasn't funny and then it would be enough, crush, like enough hurt for me to you know, feel really horrible about myself. Uh, yeah, maybe you're searching for happiness and you haven't found it yet. And I reckon, oh, it's, 
it's tough because it, I don't want to stand here and say, oh, just have God's will in your life and it'll be all good. Because there, be, there, there will be obstacles in life. But I know that you can, based on the, the, the purity and, and the lovingness of God, you can trust that his key to happiness is the right thing. So maybe you're going through and you're trying to find happiness and you're a bit discontent. If that's the case, I really do invite you to, to try and seek God's will in your life. And, and it's as simple as those five steps that I gave you before. But maybe you're also trying to make a decision and, and you want to make sure that God's will is in your life. And that's a perfect time to try and follow those five steps as well. So if you're in either of those situations, it's not much of an appeal, but I am going to just invite you to try and seek God out. And in your own time, maybe you can take a walk today or something like that and really ask to have God's will in your life. Thanks, guys. We might invite the, the singers up and they can sing the hymn.